give a big round of applause. Dave Smith, everybody. Thanks. So I don't have a real plan here. I like to just kind of wing it. And so interruptions are good at any time. Uh, I like questions. It reminds me of how Bob Moog used to do things. He'd walk into a room and just say, somebody get me started. And then somebody would ask a question and that, that would take it the rest of the night. Uh, I will do some demonstrations and talk about the Prophet 6, which is our latest synthesizer. And it's really, really cool. And it's much better than those soft synths in front of you. Uh, we'll talk. We'll talk about that a little bit too. Boom! Ah, swinging. There is a problem. These things cost a lot of money, and those are less. So uh, it's part of the problem. We have to. When we when you make hardware, you have to compete with free because when you buy a computer, you have free soft synths. When you buy an iPad, when you get anything, there's just all these free synths everywhere. And so you know, oh, free or a whole lot of money. Uh, that's what we deal with, but actually business is really good. Uh, what we're finding is a lot of people who actually started with soft sense because they were free uh, are starting to realize there's something to a real music instrument. It's not a piece of software. It's not something where you, well, perfect example, you have a little keyboard there with a row of unlabeled knobs. Well, what do those knobs do? Well, that depends on what software you have in. So if you have this plugged in, it might do one thing. If it has this, it's something else. And that software may stop working in five years if you don't update it every year. And it's just, it's just not a musical instrument. And something like this, if you grab this knob, it'll do the same thing today, tomorrow, 30 years from now. It's actually kind of nice. I could say that you can keep this for 30 years because people have Prophet 5s from 35 years ago and are still using them. And in fact, they cost more now than they did when we sold them. Uh, conveniently ignoring inflation, of course, because uh, <laughs> that's different. Back then, a Prophet 5 cost about what it would cost to buy uh, two new cars, just as a reference point. But everybody who bought one told me they still made money off of it because it was unique and just having a Prophet 5 got you into the studio and got, got you a lot of gigs. Did I see a question? Yeah, yeah, I was just curious. What inspired you to start building equipment? Uh, okay, well, let's go way back. Uh, it all started with, in 1972, uh, I had a year before graduated from Berkeley uh, with a degree in electrical engineering and computer science. And I had played in bands in high school and college, guitar and bass, and always played the piano at home. Uh, but somebody told me this local store had a synthesizer. And I said, oh, I've kind of heard of those. And I went to go see it, and it was a mini Moog. And I had absolutely no idea how it worked, but it looked so cool because it had a whole bunch of knobs on it and a keyboard. So I went next day to my company credit union. I was actually working at Lockheed at the time because uh, engineers were not in demand in 1971. Uh, and I went to their credit union, got a loan, and the next day bought the Mini Moog. And I still have it. It's in our office. Uh, our office is in North Beach. And it's still there, and uh, we've managed to get it working again. So I bought that. Uh, the next thing is I started building things to go with it, just for my own use, and eventually built a analog sequencer. And after I built it, I figured, well, maybe somebody else would want that. And so I started a company called Sequential Circuits in 1974, and I think I sold four of the analog synth, uh, sequencers. Uh, the next thing I did is designed a little digital sequencer, and that did much better. I sold a few hundred of those, and uh, by 1977, I finally quit my day job and started working full time, and uh, that's when I got the idea of building a Profit 5. So uh, yeah, it's... Initially, I didn't even do it because I thought the idea was so obvious that the big companies then, which were Moog and ARP, well, of course they've got to be working on this. You know, I, you get a microprocessor, you use these synth chips, and you put it together, and you have a polysynth. Uh, but I realized after a few months that it didn't look like they were going to do it, so I just kind of jumped in, not totally knowing what I was doing, and in about nine months from start to finish, designed the uh, Prophet 5. So. This is great. I don't even have to give a demo. I can just keep talking. Oh, why do you think that they didn't want to make... I mean, it seems so obvious to me that having to make more than one sound at once would be... You, you would think. And programmability. That was the other side. Uh, well, ARP made a fatal mistake. They decided guitar synths were where it was going to be. 
because they made the calculation that a lot of people do. They say, okay, there's X billion guitar players. If we get 0.1% of that market, we'll be rich. Well, it doesn't really work that way because nobody wanted a guitar synth because they didn't work very well. And I maintain guitar synths are still kind of weird. It's just one of those things I don't think is meant to be, you know, I, I don't want to play a B3 on my guitar. I want to play a guitar on my guitar. Uh, but that's what killed them, and they put all their emphasis there, and they claimed at the time, oh yeah, well we were thinking of doing a polysynth, but we did this instead, so. Uh, Moog was just always kind of behind the curve, so I don't know why. Uh, so when you initially uh, designed the Prophet 5, did you have a certain sound in mind that you wanted to get to, or were you just more concerned about, let me see what I can design to fit in this box at the time and see what happens? Designing instruments, you usually don't start from a sound, it's like even now, we don't try to design an instrument for EDM and techno, or design one for rock and roll, or design one for... Uh, yeah, that's, it's, it's more knowing that, okay, if I have two oscillators and, and a filter and X amount of modulation, that it's gonna probably be pretty cool. But you don't really know what it's gonna sound like until it's done, which is, it's, Sometimes you could simulate parts of it. Like with the Prophet 5, I actually breadboarded one voice uh, just with a few controls, and it sounded pretty cool, so I knew that having five of those was really going to be awesome. But you still don't know until you get it all together and start playing the notes the first time. Even now, it's kind of fun when we build a new product because you, you think it's going to sound cool, and you try some parts of it, but until you actually get the thing working the first time, you don't know... It's not whether it's gonna sound good or not, it's more the personality of the instrument. Because uh, historically, uh, there's been a ton of times where an instrument will come out and it sounds the way it sounds, it has its personality, and people will decide at that point that it's not an interesting sound and not fashionable, and so nobody buys it, and then five years later when they stop making it, then, oh, hey, this sounds really cool. Uh, the Prophet VS, we went through that. When we built them and started shipping them, it has its own sound. There's nothing that sounds like a Prophet VS. I mean, never since. Uh, if you haven't actually played one, uh, it's hard to describe. It had a fairly limited sound palette, so it couldn't do everything, but what it did was really unique. But when we came out with it, it was lukewarm. You know, people weren't that interested, and after a couple years, we just stopped building them. And then two years later, all of a sudden, you know, due to a you know, couple high-profile Prince-like things happened, and then all of a sudden, everybody wanted a Prophet VS. Uh, the Roland stuff, you know, 808s, 303s, you know, when that stuff came out, we all laughed. You know, it's like, pfft. you know, we had these great sample-based drum machines, you know, boom, 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 and everybody, you know, just big, huge sounds, and then they had these things, and it's, well, that doesn't sound like a drum machine, you know. And, Nobody bought them, and they kind of went away, and then all of a sudden, some people in Detroit or wherever started going, hey, I got this little thing for 50 bucks, and it kind of sounds cool. And now, of course, you know, you can't buy an, an original one. and So timing, uh, fashion, whatever. So it, getting back to the sound of the design, it's, you know, an inst a real musical instrument has its own personality, or it should. Uh, that's, I'm a big proponent of that. We try to design that into our instruments, and that's another reason why, you know, those things don't have personality. Software can't really have personality, I don't think. It's too much like work, you know, when you're looking at a screen and dragging menus with a mouse. Uh, I just like to, you know, like I said, reach over. You know, make it sound the way I want it to sound, and... and it's always the right there. I don't, have, I don't have to think about it. So, anyhow, that's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> um, so I'll talk a little bit about the Prophet Six. Uh, in my second company, Dave Smith Instruments, that I started in 2002, the first product was the Evolver. And the concept there, I was trying to do something different. I didn't want to recreate old stuff. I never really have. So I, I had digital oscillators, but analog filters, and then some feedback, interesting concepts of uh, the interaction of analog and digital. Because I don't, you know, didn't really take sides and analog is better, digital is better, it's just different. Uh, and over the years, uh, came, I tried to come out with different ideas and came out with the Prophet 08, that was already eight years ago. Uh, but I never tried to do the old stuff. I was always trying to do something 
new and different. The Prophet 12 is much different than the Prophet 08. Uh, so when it came to the Prophet 6, I finally kind of partially caved and said, okay, let's build something that's not a Prophet 5, but kind of has more of the heart and soul of it, and that's in two different areas. Uh, one main difference is it's the first instrument I've done this time around that has voltage-controlled oscillators instead of digitally controlled oscillators. How many people are familiar with the buzzwords? I don't know how deep to go with. Okay, good. Uh, the problem with DCOs is they got a bad rap because they were done in the 80s and their, the implementation was horrible. Uh, but a digital, people don't, a lot of people don't realize a digitally controlled oscillator is 100% analog. The wave shape coming out of it is, it's analog, it's not digital. The only thing that's digital is determining the pitch which is determined digitally. But the analog, it's a charging capacitor, the wave shapes are exactly the same as a voltage-controlled oscillator. So that's what we did in the Prophet 08 because it's more stable and you don't have to worry about all the drifting and that sort of thing. But in here, for the first time in 30 years, we went back to good old-fashioned voltage-controlled oscillators. Uh, Fortunately, technology has improved quite a bit since the last time we used them, so we do some clever things to make sure they're always in tune. We don't have the drift problems that a lot of most other analog synths do these days. Uh, most other people aren't building polyphonic synths, and a lot of them aren't even building uh, programmable uh, analog synths. So when you, when you do that, it doesn't matter how well the, the tuning is because you just, it doesn't matter. When you build a polyphonic unit, each voice has to be exactly the same, so that is much more of a technical challenge. But we have ways of compensating so the oscillators are always in pitch. In fact, they're so good that we added a slop control, so if you wanted to make it sound more like the older instruments, you can do it. So, uh, if I... That's taken to the extreme, but... That's just a little loud. Well, more than a little. So, they're good enough to do that. So that was, the voltage controlled oscillators one thing. The other thing is we took uh, the knob per function interface all the way to the very bottom. Our other instruments like the Prophet 08 and the Prophet 12, et cetera, you know, it's mostly, uh, knob per function, but there's, there's really deep uh, mod modulation matrices and a lot of other functions that you have to at least go one level onto a screen in order if you want to do complete mapping of things. On this thing, there is no screen, as you can see. Uh, you know, you have a program display uh, and then everything else is live. In fact, unlike any other synth made these days, there's actually a preset button. If you turn it off, the whole front panel is live and it may not even make sound. I'm gonna see what happens. Ah, it doesn't. Cool. Okay. So uh, you have to actually turn things the way you want it in order to make sounds. And you can't do that on other synths because it's not knob per function. So the combination of that and a number of other things. I mean, if you compare it to a Prophet 5, it has modern features like velocity and pressure on the keyboard after touch. Uh, we have a sequencer and arpeggiator. Uh, we added a sub octave. Uh, oscillator, we have a high pass filter uh, in addition to the low pass. Uh, we have an analog distortion, so. Gets nasty real quick. We have a, a complete effects section uh, with digital effects, which is something actually we haven't done on any of our products before, so that's actually new too. So again, compared to a Prophet 5, it goes well beyond it. but. Because of the way the circuits are designed, it really has the same heart and soul that the original Prophet 5 did. In fact, uh, a guy named John Bowen, who actually has a company that makes the Solaris synth, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that, uh, he created the first 40 presets on the original Prophet 5. So I had him come down and create those same presets on this thing. And we were amazed how close they were when we, we had a, my Prophet 5 was right next to the Prophet 6 and we A-B'd them on all 40 sounds and it's amazingly close. I mean, sometimes indistinguishable, mostly indistinguishable. So it's just really cool how, how that came out. So that was the concept and we've been shipping this for almost six months now and it's by far the most popular product we've had. 
out of the gate like that. We're a small company. There's only 12 of us. Uh, so it's not like we're a Roland or Yamaha or anything. Uh, but it's, it's doing quite well, and the reception has been pretty awesome. People, it, I've, I've been surprised pleasantly how many people specifically point to the idea that it's really simple. And everything is right here. You don't have to hunt through things. And so that combined with the, just the sound of the unit is, I think, what people are latching on to. So, you know, for me, it's always kind of weird because I suppose I should have done this first. If I had made this instrument 10 years ago, my company would have grown significantly faster from the beginning. But it's just not what I wanted to do. I wanted to build new things and different things. Um, the other thing that's new here is just a name, and that's, uh, is it here, sequential? Yeah. Uh, the story there, I don't know if, probably most of you read the story, but uh, when sequential in the late 80s was kind of going downhill, Yamaha bought the company. And it was the kind of thing where nobody made any money on it, it was just kind of keeping us from going under. And then they ended up closing it a year later, uh, anyhow. And that's when I went over and actually started the Korg R&D group, which is still in existence. And they're the ones who, d we designed the wave station when I was still there. And, you know, they designed the Kronos products, I think, at Korg R&D. So, uh, anyway, uh, Yamaha technically owned the sequential circus name because they bought the company. So, I, it didn't bother me. I just started my new company, Dave Smith Instruments, and, you know, I never thought about that. But what happened is... Uh, my friend uh, Ikuturu Kakahashi, who's the founder of Roland and was the president of Roland for, for almost ever until the last three or four years, uh, he and I both got a Grammy for MIDI two years ago. And what he did at... <laughs> plug. Uh, so, but what he did, and I didn't know this was happening, he sent a letter to the president of Yamaha and said, you know, you ought to, you ought to give D Dave the rights to the names back. And I had no idea this was going on until I got this random email from somebody at Yamaha and they said, well, this just happened and it's okay with us. Do you want the names back? And I kind of went, okay, you know, I, I, sure, you know, why not? And at first we had no plans for using the name, but right about the same time as when we were just starting to work on this, and it soon became obvious that, well, if we're ever going to use the name, this is the time to use the name. And you know, I'm not one who usually cares much about the marketing aspects of things, but I have to say that probably having the sequential name on it has a big impact on at least the awareness of the product. And, you know, it's a sequential profit six, so that gets people's attention that much more, I think. So that's part of the deal. Um, I could probably just go through and play a few sounds. It's This is kind of easy to demonstrate because I could just cheat and hit the sequencer. So the sequencer is really cool. It's two buttons. There's a record button and a play button. So if I hit record, and, and it's, it's a step sequencer, so it doesn't pick up the timing. But it's also a polyphonic synthesizer, so if I want to, you know. So it's just real, real simple to use, and it saves a different sequence on every sound, so it's really nice to be able to just go in and start things up. Uh, so it could do other th sounds, like, you know, this sound is kind of reminds me of a Peter Gabriel sound. Uh, little sidetrack here, when you make programs for a synthesizer for the f factory presets, if you want to call them that, uh, usually what you have to do is make these huge monstrous sounds because you're aiming it towards people who walk into a music store and the first thing they do is hit a C triad chord and then go through and play every single sound and you know you want them to be impressed so you get these huge sounds. The problem with those sounds is they don't work in a mix. I mean, you're not going to take these monstrous sounds and try to actually use them in a song because they'd wipe out the whole bandwidth and have nothing left to play with. So a sound like this is kind of the opposite of that. It's just...
So it's just two notes, but it's just, there's something about that sound. And that's why that, that just reminds me of a Peter Gabriel song, because he used the Prophet 5 extensively back then on a lot of those albums. And that's one of the things that analog gives you that I don't think digital does as much. And I, artists tell me this all the time. There's something about these instruments when you're in a studio that they just sit in the mix much better than a digital instrument, which sometimes is just all over the place. I mean, these things will cut through, so it's not like you're not going to notice them, but for some reason they just fit in there better. And don't ask me to explain why. I could just say it's the magic of analog or make up something silly like that. But the point is that it actually seems to be true. <laughs> um, so let's see. Uh, the arpeggiator is always fun to play with. Arpeggiators are always fun because you just turn them on and they kind of make anything sound good. Um, effects, it's great for doing instant soundtracks. Fun with delays. I'm, I'm a sucker for delays. What can I say? Reverb. What? There's an insane reverb there. Yeah, there is some. Uh, actually, yeah, there was a big hall reverb. So the effects we have, uh, let's see, we have a, uh, two delays. We have a regular delay. We have a bucket brigade delay, uh, chorus, two different kinds of phasers. Uh, and then uh, we have two different delays or two different effects that you could have on. And then the second one has those same ones. A, uh, plus some reverbs, a hall, a room, and a plate, and a spring, which I will demonstrate a little later because there's some fun things you can do with that. Um, so let's see, other sounds. Uh, so. so your inner Jimi Hendrix. stuff it, so it can get nasty uh, you know some people think you know analog synths are nice and clean and well behaved but uh, we like to uh, twist things up quite a bit too um, eh, percussion you know <laughs> uh, again this is the great thing about analog synths is the range of sounds you can get from a fairly simple architecture. I actually think that at this point, uh, analog synthesis, basic subtractive synthesis, has passed the test of time. It's uh, been around since the 60s. Uh, it's still around this... I mean, it, most uh, digital synthesizers and soft synths pretty much just implement subtractive synthesis in software or digitally. Everybody knows what's going to happen when you turn a cutoff knob. I mean, it just sounds a certain way. You all know what it's going to do. Same with the resonance. It just has a sound. Every instrument might have their own flavor of how that responds, but you just know how it works. And it's just amazing to me when I look back 
and think about two oscillators, filter, VCA, and yet I can get all these different kind of sounds out of this instrument. And you know that's, that was a problem with things like FM, you know, because sure it can get a lot of things, but nobody could figure out how to use it, and it, you couldn't think about it. If you think about it, the whole any uh, old products that uh, vintage products people want now, they want the analog stuff. There's no market for uh, vintage DX7s or M1s or any of that. It's because you know what is vintage digital? What do you get out of it? There's just no. Even though. The M1 was the most successful keyboard ever made, over a quarter million of them, I mean synthesizer. Uh, there were 200,000 DX7s made, uh, and yet there were 7,000 Prophet 5s and only 13,000 Mini Moogs the first time around. So the numbers weren't huge, and yet you know, nobody plays uh, those old instruments anymore. Uh, part of what happened is Basically, starting with the Prophet 5, people used it because it was the best emulative instrument at the time. It wasn't necessarily that people wanted a synthesizer. They just wanted something that kind of played strings and brass and bass and lead and organ sounds. And the Prophet 5 was the only thing that it was the first product, actually, where you could get that in one instrument and just press a button and get different sounds. Uh, and the next big step was when the DX7 came out, and it did really well because it was only $2,000. 16 voices, it had velocity, and it sounded like a Rhodes and didn't weigh 200 pounds. And that was 90% of why it did so well. So, but again, it was, people were thinking more emulative. So when the M1 finally came out in uh, 87 maybe, uh, it was the first sample-based playback machine, Rompler, uh, and that was kind of the beginning of the end, because now people finally had real piano, real strings, real brass, real saxophones, whatever, uh, in a keyboard. And ever since then, Korg, Yamaha, Roland, all they've been doing is building, until recently, building M1s. It says every M1 is bigger and better than the one two years before. It's got more voices, it's got better samples, it's got longer samples, it's got more bits, bytes, and whatever. But it's basically, you know, a Rompler today is really not that much different than an M1. It's just better. So that's, I think, one of the reasons why the whole analog resurgence has happened, because it just got to the point where people are tired of that and they want something that actually has some life to it that's not just the same old thing. And I think that, that's a big part of this. Um, Uh, if I could remember, uh, <laughs> I think that was, you know, I think the original emu uh, emulator was already out. I don't think the emulator 2 was out yet, and we just realized that we could do a better job of uh, designing a sampler, or at least we thought, and we hadn't done anything digital, and we knew that we kind of had to do digital stuff, uh, more digital than we were because people were getting moving on. They wanted something new, and the analog stuff wasn't selling as well. So we just decided to jump in and build a sampler. But what was cool about it is it was digital samples, but they were played back through analog filters, which gave it, a, a, I think, a, a really nice sound compared to a pure digital machine. Uh, as with any analog polyphonic synth, it's expensive because however many voices you have, you have to have that many uh, circuits inside. So inside a Prophet 6, there's actually six different monophonic synthesizers that are controlled by the computer. In fact, you know, I can't take it apart easily, but we actually have these little cards. We have a, the whole voice is on a little card about this big with a bunch of tiny parts on both sides of the board and shrunk down, and then there's six of them that just plug into the board. So uh, that's why it's so expensive. So even back then with a sampler, we, you know, if we had a on the 2000, it was eight voice units, so we had to have eight sets of circuitry to play back through the individual filters. But it sounded better. So, but uh, I'd, beyond that, I don't know that there was any, you know, specific reason for doing it. I was like one of my first samplers. So I was ah, <laughs> cool. Yeah, we used a lot actually. Um, I have another question. Okay. Mm -hmm. On the back, but no USB. No, USB is there. Oh, there is USB? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I, I couldn't see it from here. So 
Yeah, about four or five years ago, we started putting USB yeah. on everything. So you kind of have to. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, what made you decide to do uh, a quantized uh, oscillator frequencies rather than having this? Oh, continuous? Yeah. Uh, it's mostly just for ease of use. So if you want to dial in a pitch, it steps in semitones. So it's probably a little less useful as a live control, but it's more useful when you're actually making patches and you just want to dial something up quickly. For patches and everything yeah. dialed in, but for like a live use of like matching, let's say, harmonizing pitches, you know, on the fly. Uh, well, that, there is a master tune if you're just doing little tweaks. Yeah. So if, if you're talking, I thought you were talking about just wanting to do a big frequency well, sweep. Yeah, well, you can do a hard sweep, but I was thinking also just kind of on the fly, just changing the harmonizing pitches. Wow, yeah. Well, there is a master fine tune mm -hmm. and a master transpose, so you can take the whole instrument up and down. Okay. But there won't be any like future firmware updates where you can option to take out the quantization. No plans for that okay. at the moment. But actually, that's a just something interesting to talk talk about is features on an instrument. Uh, I've always been a fan of constrained designs where you don't have everything and it doesn't do everything, but you have enough there to keep you busy and to come up with enough good sounds. In fact, the hardest thing we have when we design a product is knowing where to cut off the features. Because if you, if you say any new feature, you know, it, if you, anybody out here, well, just what you just mentioned, if you say, is this a good idea? Sure. Yeah, it's, nobody's going to say no to a feature, right? It's a good idea. All features are good ideas. The problem is you can't do them all. Otherwise, it ends up like a, you know, I've looked at some of these soft synths. I'd look at them, and they'll have like 400 filter types. You know, what? You know, who in their right mind is going to even touch, you know, half of those or a tenth of them? Or if somebody else advertised once, it's going to take the rest of your life to learn all the features in our synth. Uh, I don't want to spend the rest of my life learning all the features. I just want to play the instrument. Uh, so it's, it's a real problem with software because it's so easy, as you know, to just add another menu, another drag down thing here. It's adding features is easy. And some people just do love new features. But if you're trying to make music, to me, you should have something that's very specific and concise. And sure, you know, I could probably name 20 things that this doesn't do that we talked about and decided that we didn't want to have it on there because you have to draw the line somewhere. I mean, we, we'd have a panel that was you know, twice as big and, and much more confusing. Uh, the other thing I'll say, and this, you know, I usually don't say this, but it's true that most people really don't fully understand how a synthesizer really works. Uh, you know, some people can find their way around a little bit. Like I said, you know what the cutoff knob does, you know some of this other stuff. But I'm always surprised when I see somebody come and visit us and they'll go into our demo room and they'll walk up to a synthesizer and they'll play some notes and then they grab a knob. I always watch to see what knob they turn. And it's interesting how many people, even people you would think know what they're doing, turn a knob that clearly for the sound you're playing will do nothing. And indeed they turn it and nothing happens and then they go to another knob. And I've never actually asked them, I probably should, but I don't, you know, I don't want to make people feel bad. Uh, and it's not a problem. It, I mean, the other good thing about these synths is that you can buy these and know nothing about how it works and just start turning knobs and see what happens. And if you like what you come up with, you hit right and you have a new sound. Uh, I actually had a customer complain once that he, he had a poly evolver, I think. And he said that his roommate was getting better sounds than him out of the instrument, but his roommate knew absolutely nothing about the instrument. But he would just go up and start turning knobs and come up with a cool sound. So it, it's not totally necessary to fully understand it, but it's just, it's always been surprising to me. And that, that kind of goes back to what I said before, people bought synthesizers originally to be emulative, not because they wanted to be a synthesizer player. With USB? Yeah. Uh, USB is pretty much just MIDI over USB. We, we don't do MIDI audio. Uh, it seems somewhat pointless. We have audio outputs. Everybody has audio inputs if they want to run it into their computer or whatever. But uh, it just simplifies the, the design quite a bit. So. How many kind of sounds can you say? 
Uh, the Prophet 6 comes with 1,000 sounds, but actually 500 of them are factory presets and can't be changed, and the other 500 can, and we just duplicated them. So you can start with the uh, uh, non-factory presets, and if you find something you like by changing it, you can save it and not have to worry about losing the original. So there's, you know, there's a lot of sounds in here. That's really hard. Uh, it's, I always tell people the analog market is really small, and I think it still is, and I think it's got, you know, everybody's talking about analog, of course, and everybody wants an analog synth, and modular synths, as you know, are a pretty big deal, but it's really compared to, you know, like, uh, a Nord electro keyboard, you know, where it's just basically something for cover bands to play pianos on. They sell significantly more of those probably than uh, of synthesizers that are sold. It still is more of a specialized thing overall. The market is not that big. Um, but for a company our size, it's perfect. I mean, we, like, we're, we're quite successful. Business is good. It's profitable. It's working, working really well because part of my plan was just to keep the company a reasonable size. Our products are built in San Francisco. I think most of you know that, uh, as opposed to everybody, just about everybody else is built in China now. Even Moog is building over there now. Uh, but we like building them here. It just seems right for many reasons. Did you see um, on the Stephen Colbert show, the guy was playing Prophet 6 the first night, opening night? Oh, yeah. I wasn't here when that happened, but I heard about it. Yeah, it was pretty exciting. Yeah. And then he was, it seems like they switch keyboard players in and out, because then he went away, and then two weeks later, somebody else came who had a, a Prophet 6. Right, okay, right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, we obviously sell a lot to artists, and uh, you know, people use them for all different kinds of music. Like I said earlier, we don't make them for any particular genre, but you know, the EDM techno guys love it, the com movie composers love this kind of thing, um, and then any kind of you know, rock, jazz, alternate, Etc. Was there any music you liked in the 70s that, that used the Prophet 6? Like more the uh, towards electronic kind of side of things versus the. Jazz? Say that again? Was there, was there any music you liked that was made with the Prophet 6 or the Prophets in general in the 70s? Oh, there's, yeah, there's yeah, a like, ton you know, of music. Not, right, right, but <laughs> that you liked that was like. Um, more Me personally, music. well, you know, this time around, you know, if I had to pick a favorite group, it would be somebody like Radiohead and. They all have lots of our products. Um, you know, there's, there's. I tend to like more alternate music. Uh, you know, so Arcade Fire. I mean, there's a tons of smaller, bigger groups. But you know, Taylor Swift plays a Prophet 12 in concert now. I mean, it's. We actually, <laughs> truth be known, we actually made her a special custom white Prophet 12, and she, she plays it on one song where she's on this lift thing and she goes flying in the air playing this prophet, white Prophet 12. So that's pretty cool. But, you know, so it's everybody from Radiohead and Nine Inch Nails to Arcade Fire to, uh, you know, Alicia Keys, uh, Black Keys. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of all over the place, which is fun. I mean, and, and me, I, one of my favorite things to do is to go see live music. And so I just love it when, you know, people come in town and we get to see uh, bands y using our stuff and, you get free you know. tickets? What? You get free tickets? Yes. <laughs> Even better, I get to hang out backstage with them. I have a great picture of me and Taylor. <laughs> See the Proto Men? Did they count? Yeah, they're kind of metal, right? Yes, of course. Uh, that's part of the thing too is we don't know everybody who uses our stuff, so uh, I'm sure. Has that a keyboard on the side when he performs? I imagine, like, in the sounds he presented to us, like through that, like they just kind of remind me. Yeah. Well, well, sure. I mean, this thing can make sounds for any of those kind of bands, and it's just a matter of whether they pick up on it. But again, this thing, more than any of our other synths, seems to be going into the artist round a lot faster and immediate. I mean, it's just... Can you add more instruments? You said that 500 were just factory-made, and then right. 500 you could alter. Could you add more to that? Or 
you can't add them, but you could dump them to a computer. So you could dump all 500 and download another 500 if you want. But internally, no. But 500's an awfully lot. It's <laughs> 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 it, in fact, it's funny because, you know, we, when we're voicing things, we send it out to a bunch of people, you know, to come up with sounds. And inevitably, when they come back, they all, there's a few handful of sounds that they all made. Because it's just, you know, a typical pad-like sounds. They all, everybody has a sound that's like this. Um, and then, so we have to take them out so there's not, you know, every five sounds sounds the same. So it's actually trickier than you think sometimes to come up with 500 unique sounds. Um, but it's a lot, and, and since you're already, 500 of your own sounds on top of the 500 factory is a lot, plenty, so. Yeah, I was curious about the, uh, the sound designers that put together the, the factory settings or whatever. Um, is that, I mean, so when you fool around with it, you can make all these incredible sounds. Like, what is it that you think is particularly unique that the people who designed those sounds kind of brought to it? Well, a lot of it's a matter of really polishing the sounds. Some people can slop together something, but, you know, does something happen when you turn the mod wheel? Does something happen when you do pressure? Does something happen when you hit the sequence button? Uh, if you turn the arpeggiator on, will something work that makes sense? So there's a lot of the polishing aspects of it. Uh, beyond that, we just try to get a lot of variety, especially in the first handset. You know, we everybody starts a program zero, one, two, three, four. So you try to get those to be as different as you can so that you immediately show off the uh, ability of the instrument to do a lot of different things. Uh, well, it's always funny because, you know, most artists will say, well, I never use factory presets and, you know, I was making changes. And they, they might because it's real easy to take any sound and, you know, just change the cutoff slightly and it's a different sound and then it, it, now it's your own. Uh, but no, it, it's, it's all good. It's fun to see what people do and every once in a while people will do something that you didn't think of and that, that's always fun. Uh, you know, my favorite story with that is on the Prophet 5. You know, it had the same set of switches. I think we only had eight of them. Uh, but you could change patches just by doing that. Well, Brian Eno was the first person who would hit, hit a chord and then play it by changing presets and, and having that be the sound as opposed to the other way around, playing, selecting a preset and changing sounds. So it, that's the fun part about coming out with an instrument. You get to see what the musicians do with it that you didn't think about. Because uh, there's, there's always something, or they come out with a sound and you go, wow, I didn't know I could do that. Pyramind is the premier center for training in music and audio production. Set in the heart of San Francisco, Pyramind is surrounded by some of the biggest and best innovators on the planet. Not only are we a cutting edge production school, we're also an award winning music and audio production company. Learn from the team that's delivering award-winning content to the world's largest companies, as well as current artists who play the biggest stages around the globe. Our community events put you in touch with the vibrant local music scene, as well as touring DJs and producers, workshops, internships, and guest lecturers. Because we know the more involved you are, the further you'll go. You'll also be steeped in a vibrant community of like-minded creatives. Learn and collaborate with fellow students from around the world and create a long-term professional network that you'll lean on throughout your career. We've taken great care to make our programs about you. Choose from powerful career-driven programs to genre-specific ones. Start small and get your feet wet or build a custom program tailored towards your personal needs. If you can't make it to San Francisco, you can enroll in our acclaimed online classes, 24-7 access to high-quality video training modules, challenging projects, and live interactions and project feedback with your instructors. Experience what Pyramind can do for you. Tell us where you want to go in your career. We can help you get there.